Welcome to the studio, yeah. Mr. Gilan Gork. Woo! Mentalist. Awesome to be here, man. Mm-hmm. Welcome. <sighs> welcome, welcome. What is it that you do? I, just, just to, to give a, a descriptor of what it is that you do. All right, cool. Well, you know, people know me as a mentalist. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have never heard of what a mentalist is. Their, their reference is the TV show, The Mentalist. Mm. Uh, his character is loosely based on someone like me who pretended to have psychic powers and then the people attacked his family and he worked for the FBI and all that. So I don't do work for the FBI. Mm. Um, but I do... Um, I do enjoy giving demonstrations and teaching people all around influence. And sometimes I do these really crazy experiments, uh, these mentalist feats, uh, where I'm trying to influence people to think of certain things or to do certain things, or I'm trying to read what people are, are thinking. And, and, and that can seem like psychic or supernatural powers, but there's actually quite an academic side to what I do, psychology, body language, all of that kind of stuff. So you can, in essence, read somebody's mind. You can... Uh, and this all helps because I've seen your shows. Um, it, it used to be purely for entertainment purposes, like the wow factor, like mm. the Darren Brown sort of stuff. And uh, now you've kind of moved into the business arena and helping people influence customers, um, clients, deals, I guess, and yeah. even uh, people on the ground helping you influence how to get a better salary and that sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. I mean, I was doing all of these things as as entertainment and I'd have leaders come up to me afterwards and say, you know what, we know that leadership and influence are the same thing. Even if we're leading a client to make a decision, which is sales, or if we're leading our team to move in a certain direction because the world is constantly changing. So we have to keep, we have to be nimble and agile. And so how do we actually use these in a, in a, in a practical sense? And so, you know, obviously on the entertainment side, there's a, there's a bunch of methodology and there's a bunch of experience that I have there. And so I kind of combined that with certain models of influence uh, that I've created that can actually be used in the context of business. And so that's what I do mostly now is I travel around the world and I speak to leaders uh, and help them increase their influence in positive ways. So there's a difference. I was about to say, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. Yes. Are you just moving into spaces already knowing what people are about before you meet them? Is it that kind so, of So although the power. experiments that I do could seem like psychic abilities, <laughs> I don't hear people's voices uh, in my head. And this is the Tinder swindler, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could really just take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the thing with influence is that it doesn't always work with every person all the time. And the world would mm. be a really scary place if it did. Yeah. But if you know the, the principles and techniques of influence, then you're able to influence more people most of the time. And what, so, what are those principles? So there's various principles. I mean, the influence is, is, is so broad. Um, the principles that I teach are based on what people are thinking subconsciously every single time they're interacting with you. And if you're able to flip certain switches in people's minds, uh, then you're able to create things like trust and credibility and support. And that's the kind of influence that... Uh, uh, that I that I teach out there in a practical and, and, and what kind of people are easiest to influence? Also, are you kind of looking at Darren Sibs and I? Can you tell who is going to be the easiest to influence by just looking at us? <laughs> Susceptible. <laughs> uh, sometimes I don't go for the easiest person uh, to influence. Because um, that would be boring. But a weird be thing. Funny. A weird <laughs> thing. <laughs> so a weird thing is that actually somebody who's trying really hard not to be influenced, mm. often they're the easiest to influence. Mm. because we become what's called predictably irrational. So somebody is trying to do their best to be unpredictable, but actually we find that our irrationalities happen the same way over and over and over again if you look at the majority of people. So there's certain ways that you can do and say things that's going to evoke a similar pattern of thinking or a certain response. And Darren, you know this from, from comedy. I mean, when you do the same jokes in a show over and over, you start to learn if you just pause a little bit more, you get a different response, right? Mm, yeah. So you almost start to realize how people's responses can be influenced by even small little changes in the way that you're either asking something or saying something or mm. creating a pause before something. And that's because people become predictably irrational. So it's not always like who's the easiest. It's actually like who's the, the bigger fight you put up sometimes actually can turn you into the easiest from the hardest to the easiest. So, so your wife cannot have an argument with you ever. <laughs> when she says, I'm fine, you know exactly what she's thinking. <laughs> hey. Well, we know that one for sure. But... <laughs> 
emotion gets in the way. This is the thing is that humans are not thinking machines that feel. We're actually feeling machines that think. Mm. And so we, we think that things are logical. And the minute we get emotion involved, it actually can make us think in ways that are not so rational. Uh, that's my kryptonite too. I mean, Look, if I could do what you do, I would enter Survivor. I would enter Big Brother. I would enter every single reality show that has like a million rand prize because I'd get to the end. I'd get to the end with what you're able to do. Well, maybe, maybe, but people are unpredictable in the sense that as much, so here's the, here's the misconception about influence. Mm. You think to yourself, and we put all of this pressure on ourselves in life, that we need to control the outcome of everything in life. Mm-hmm. And we have, it's called, I call it the paradox of control. The more we think we actually control life, the less control we actually have, because we're more in tune with what we want and not what reality actually is in front of mm-hmm. us. So the best way to actually have the most control in life is to let go of some control. Mm. Mindfulness. So mindfulness, mm. is, a, is a, that's self-influence, right? And self-influence is just as important. So I might enter these uh, these shows, mm. but I don't control everyone all the time and everything. Um, and so I can't guarantee that I would win. I might have a lot of fun with it, though. <laughs> but I mean, now, I want to do a practical example here. So, so, so what is this? Uh, the staple gun is coming, guys. The staple gun is coming. But this is, um, let's say, an icebreaker. So this is, what is this? You, you give me five cards here. Okay, so you've got, so you guys, if I had to say a murder mystery board game, what do you guys think of? Cluedo. Cluedo, right? Cluedo, Cluedo. All right. Yeah. A lot of people remember Cluedo from, from their childhood. Um, it basically is a murder mystery game, and everyone listening right now, you guys can kind of play along here as well. It's a murder mystery board game. You would have to figure out who killed who in which area of the house. Like, was it Miss Scarlet with the gun in the library? <laughs> and so there were different cards that people would get, and you would win the game if you could guess what was the hidden information inside an envelope. I used to try re like reverse engineer the, the game and try and read what my friends were thinking, and then just through deduction to choose what was inside the envelope. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? So I have with me, Darren's actually holding them right now, uh, five of the six Cluedo cards. This is actually from the original Cluedo set when I was a kid. So there were actually six weapons, but the one, the wrench was lost. Uh, Darren is holding five of them, which is the, the knife. Um, I can't actually see them through the computer. It's a rope, remember. candlestick, pistol, knife, and lead pipe. And lead pipe. Okay. So I'm going to go through a little experiment with you guys with the theme of, it, of, uh, uh, of Cluedo. By and the way, we're live on Facebook. Um, KFMZA mm-hmm. on cool. Facebook. Yeah, so you guys can uh, can tune in right. and watch this. So this is actually based on how they legit how the FBI caught a serial killer. Um, and so I, I'm going to try a little lie detection type of mind reading thing with you guys to determine which weapon you're thinking of. Now the thing is, I have to actually get you guys. Uh, getting kind of connected with the weapon and almost being able to imagine holding it in your hand. So I'm going to turn my back. Yeah. Darren, would you go around and um, you can give the ladies each one weapon to, to choose and then I want you to choose must one I as well. Must I give it at random or must they pick one? Either way. It doesn't okay. matter. My back will be turned. Uh, you can do it however you like. Okay. Um, and you do need to look at which weapon you've got. That's important. And when you've got the weapon after, I want you to sandwich it in your hands like this. So that when I come to you, obviously I can't see what it is, but I need you to just keep it in your hand because I'm going to go through a little visualization experiment and just keep your hand like nice. At, like You don't have to keep it up here. Just mm-hmm. keep it down. And then I'll turn around. Does that make sense? Okay. Perfect. Okay. I'm turning around. Okay. All right. Okay. Hand us our weapons, Darren. Choose your weapon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my, my uh, back is turned. So everyone knows that I cannot see mm. which weapon everyone is choosing. Uh, They're obviously being very careful to not let anyone, uh, especially me, Uh see when I turn around. Darren will have two cards left over, which he'll put in his pocket. So it's not like I could um, somehow uh, like know Mm -hmm. what any of them are. Do you all have a weapon in your hands? We all do, yes. You know what your weapon is, right? Yes. yes. And you guys are sandwich. So when I turn around now, it's safe. Okay. Uh-huh. We're going to try to do this really quickly. I'm going to have to take off my headset here. I'm going to come and share the mic with each of you. I'm going to have to look you in the eye. I'm going to get you to say certain weapons out loud. Whatever you do, try your best not to give away what your weapon is. Really try hard not to give it away. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to come first over to Sherlyn. Hold on a sec. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, just... Relax. Imagine that you're holding this thing, whatever it is. Just repeat after me. Say out loud. I'm going to say all five weapons. First, say knife. Knife. Say candlestick. Candlestick. Lead pipe. Lead pipe. Rope. Rope. Gun. Gun. Okay, this is really interesting. This is really interesting. There's something that you said here 
Um, and it was just by pure kind of coincidence uh, that we started off with knife. Uh, and as you said, as I said, say knife, you had like a little bit of a look on your face, like oh, maybe because uh, you were like not sure. That, but don't say anything because it might actually tell me that we don't want to confirm each we don't want to confirm each time if i'm right or wrong okay so um so but but when i was saying you were thinking of the knife i mean your whole face is so animated <laughs> you don't even need to be a mentalist to tell that i do think that you've got the i do think you've got the knife i might change my mind maybe i'm totally off and maybe you're just a little bit nervous because i'm looking you deep in the eye i'm so nervous <laughs> <laughs> but i do think that you've got i do think that you've got the knife okay hold on one second okay uh, face me i want to take i want to take your um your um uh, what is it called again your pulse my pulse your pulse imagine holding this weapon mm -hmm. so now he's taking a pulse okay just and he's imagining. looking <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> It's intimidating, eh? So, okay, so this is really weird. It, it, just imagine using this weapon. Okay, that was interesting. Now, if the camera, if I don't know if the camera was on her eyes. The minute I asked her if she could imagine using it, her eyes moved to the side like once and back straight, straight back at me, which means that it was an easy weapon for you to imagine using. <laughs> so it would be an obvious weapon. The not obvious weapons are the rope, uh, 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 lead pipe and the candlestick, right? Uh, which would be the knife or the gun, but I think that you've got the knife, so I do think that you've got the gun. Um, and so, let's just... Uh, <laughs> He's creepy, I'm telling you. He's, He's creepy, creepy this guy. That, that's if I'm right about it. <laughs> okay. All right, so there was a bit of resistance there. I think that if you're imagining, because by now you know I'm imagining everyone holding it. I don't know if this, may, I may be looking into things and I may be wrong, but it might be something heavier that you're holding over here, which is good because it would confirm to me that they might have two lighter things, which would be a knife and a gun. Um, just say lead pipe. Lead pipe. Say rope. Rope. <laughs> say candlestick. Candlestick. Okay, say lead pipe. Lead pipe. Rope. Rope. Candlestick. Candlestick. Went a little bit. You went a little bit higher on. Which one do you guys think he's got? No. You think he's got the rope? And everyone listening to this uh, as well, you know, you can hear his voice. Why did you think that he got the rope? Uh, it, it, there was a bit of a pitch there. There was, right? Yeah. There was definitely a bit of a pitch there. A little bit more volume. I think that you've got the rope. So if we're right about this, and mm. as you can see, I'm not the only one who picked it up. So it's not like I have some special ability. We actually <laughs> all have the ability to do what I do as a mentalist. I think we've got the rope. I think we've got, with your heavy pulse that I was <laughs> feeling over here specifically, I think that we've got the gun. Uh, and thinking about a gun may do that to anyone. Uh, and I think that we've got the knife. Um, if we if I get this right, it'll be pretty cool. What do we have? Why don't you guys reveal to us? Uh, what do you have? I have the rope. As you we have the rope. <laughs> you mad man. I do. I do have the gun. It's a pistol. We've got baby. the pistol, yeah. and we've got the. I've got the knife. We've got the knife. That's My three goodness. out of three. Now, what was so interesting is that the um, the FBI actually caught someone called the Ice Pick Killer. Um, because they, they they were ran out of leads, they weren't sure what was going to happen. They had this, the the suspects repeat weapons, and there was one guy. Every time he said ice pick, he would blink a little bit longer than everyone else, and that was their only hunch. And then obviously they, they couldn't convict him based on that, but then they followed that lead and um, managed to actually convict him on all the other evidence. Sure, well, what a yeah. story. Well, my mind is blown. So, uh, <laughs> if you, do you need any more proof now that he can read your mind? Gilan Gork, the mentalist, our guest <laughs> this morning. Oh, wow. When he said, imagine yourself using the weapon, I said, I do not want to imagine myself Don't lie. <laughs> using said, a you, gun. He said you went there very quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, and, and remember, there is no supernatural power here, as he says himself. This is a mind game. This is something you want to try and learn. He's going to teach us a few more tricks mm. in a moment. He's here till eight. Hey, Gilan. Cool. You're good. There's a staple gun. Somebody's going to shoot it at your face. Oh, my Whoa. goodness. We'll see. It depends how confident I am with the influence. <laughs> um, so you even went and addressed uh, NATO. What did they... Because, you know, I'd imagine you would be one heck of a lawyer or perhaps even a Supreme Court judge. You could have been at the Zondo Commission. And when they, they lie to you, you know straight away. What a, what a, what a, what a tool in your, in your armory. 
Yeah, I've been asked to give commentary. So here and there in the media, you'll find my name in, in certain articles uh, in, in terms of politics and mm. certain high profile cases and stuff like that. Um, it's not a space that I enjoy, though. Like, I enjoy being around people and trying to develop their strengths instead of trying to find people's weaknesses and trying to, you know. So uh, that's that's why the part that I've chosen is to work with leaders. Mm. Um and it was just so weird because I, I was doing work with Singularity University. I don't know if, you, if you've heard of them before. Um, but they said to me, what's your massive transformative purpose, what they call an MTP? And the words that came out of my mouth was, I want to influence the world to influence the world. In other words, I want to work with people who have influence like leaders. And then two weeks later, I got a, an email from NATO for their strategic communications conference in, in Europe to say, will I be the opening keynote speaker? Uh, speaking to leaders uh, from over 40 countries, you know, in military, academia, private sector, politics, obviously. And that was a that was a career uh, highlight. So I do enjoy working with people like that, uh, but developing their strengths so that we can uh, we can influence and lead the world and make the world a better place. Was this around the time when NATO were trying to convince Europe, uh, Ukraine to join Europe? It was 2018, so okay. no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when you were at NATO, that they, they asked you, to present your rapid influence formula. This is something that um, anybody can apply, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, a lot of people, uh, when it comes to influence, um, we need to create influence that puts the person who we're trying to influence at the center of it, that we're trying to create a win-win situation for for everyone, right? Mm. And so um, I had developed as part of my story, we don't have the time today for me to share what my journey was, but I decided at one point to create a model of influence that I could teach others that they can create predictable influence in their life. And so the rapid influence formula is how I've deconstructed influence into three simple subconscious questions that people's minds are asking about you every single time you interact and engage with them and the more positively you answer these questions in their mind the more influence you have with them and the faster you're able to answer these questions in their minds the more rapidly you establish that influence and so it's really easy i can give it to you right now in mm. fact it's so easy that most people underestimate how powerful it is um so but listen if it's good enough for for politicians and military and everything you know it's, it's good enough for no matter what we want to use for in life mm. so the three questions people's minds are asking about you the first one is so, I, so is this like we meeting now for the first time Yes, yeah, so it can be first impressions. In fact, we don't need to meet. You can see a photograph of someone and just based on your stereotypes, biases, lens of the world, mm. the, what you perceive to be uh, good or bad or, or like whatever your beliefs and assumptions mm. are, you will already start to get a feel for these three questions of that person and you haven't okay. even met them mm. all right so okay. but yes ultimately we, we it's through our actions and behaviors that will demonstrate answers to these questions so if you try to fool someone uh, once eventually you'll actually lose a lot of influence when they realize that uh, the answers to these questions are negative yeah. but ultimately the three questions are uh, very simply the first one is are you reliable or can I rely on you? Are you? Do you say what you? Do you do what you say you're going to do when you said you're going to do it? So these are the subconscious things we are thinking when we meet a person. Yeah. So subconsciously, you're getting a feeling of whether yeah. you can rely on that person. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Are they consistent? Are they consistent in their, in their behavior, in their values? In their, like, you know, sometimes you meet somebody and they've got like a, a certain type of personality or they've got a certain mood and then you meet them again and then suddenly they're like really cold. Mm -hmm. and you're like, you never know where you stand with them. Yeah. Like that person's going to always struggle to create influence. We call them moody. Moody. Well, yeah. there you go. In, moody. in Yiddish, or, 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 there's a... Yeah, flaky. <laughs> or, fla or flaky. <laughs> so, so the first, so that's it, is are you reliable? Can I rely on you, mm -hmm. right? If you had to see somebody, uh, a photo of somebody, you're already getting a sense, even just based on what they're wearing, or how reliable you think that they would be based on mm -hmm. your ideas of the world. All right, the second question is, are you capable of helping me? Mm. We all need help with something. It could be something technical. After the pandemic, some people actually just need emotional help. Some mm. people, I, I, I just did a, a, road show, a road show for uh, healthcare professionals and it was agreed that some people are seeing healthcare professionals just to see somebody, just mm. to have some connection. So, But people always want either something inside, internal, external. Can you help them to get that? They're, they're determining in their mind whether you're able to do that. And the last question, which is actually the most important, and I've actually got a diagram that shows uh, uh, the relationships between these. And so this one kind of holds up the other two is, people are getting a feeling for, do you care about me? Mm. Will you put my interests first? Because I know lots of people who are reliable and who are capable of helping me, but if I don't think that they're gonna serve me, uh, you know, put my interests first, I'm gonna 
be influenced more by someone else. Mm. So like if you're in sales, that's a big thing. If you got a competitor who's showing more care, as an example. Uh, so what the what the diagram and what the model actually creates, when you're able to answer those three questions positively, are you reliable? Are you capable of helping me? Do you care about me? If you answer them positively in people's minds, what you're developing is trust, mm. credibility, and a sense of support. And that support is bi-directional. You're supporting them and they're supporting you as well, mm. which is really important, especially in today's kind of world of, of, of business. So in a practical sense, um, mm. how do I apply that? Um, right. So now I meet you. Now I want to influence you how yes. do i practically apply what you just told me okay cool so th- um the best way to do that like really really quickly is to use what we call mental shortcuts or the the official word for it is heuristics have you heard that term before never ever okay let me ask you a question what do you think happens more often in the world people dying uh in car accidents with two or more vehicles or it was uh, from stomach cancer what would you say? If I count to three and you just all answer together. One, two, three. Stomach cancer. Car accidents. Oh, I don't know. You know, so, okay. <laughs> you think, now, let me tell you. Okay, we're in a small studio here. There's just a few of us. And, and uh, when I do this, literally across the world, even to insurance companies that deal with this type of stuff, car accidents, 95% of the time, people will, will just get a feel that it's car accidents. Mm. But the actual answer is, correct, it's stomach sad. cancer. Mm. And so why do we get the feeling that it's car accidents? Mm, I just I've never heard of I've never heard of anybody with stomach cancer. Right. Okay. So we hear about cars, and we're driving a car every day. We're Mm -hmm. seeing cars. So this is so Mm. our brain, not knowing the actual information, because we don't have the stats in front of us, Mm. relies on a mental shortcut to say, well, what feels like the right Mm. answer? Mm. So this is what we call in psychology an availability heuristic, which is where you people will will generally feel a sense of the kind of intuition based on what's more easily, more readily available for their mind yeah. to identify or, or think of. Now, there are different principles of influence that will trigger the heuristics in people's minds that if you do and say things in a certain way, people's minds in the same way that you felt car accidents was the right answer, mm-hmm. people will feel that you are reliable, capable and care. Mm-hmm. And one of those principles, which is very, very, uh, uh, I mean, you'll identify it in your life, uh, is the principle of authority. Um, so authority, quite simply put, is that people will be more readily influenced by others who they deem to be a knowledgeable, credible authority. Mm. And um, you don't even need to hear, you, like, you just need symbols uh, mm. that, that somebody is a knowledgeable, uh, credible authority. There's a crazy experiment that was done um, by uh, Stanley Milgram, a, a scientist, who had subjects come in for an experiment. They thought it was to test the effects of punishment on learning. So if somebody was given a list of words to remember and they couldn't remember word associations, they would be given an electric shock. Mm. By the way, this experiment is banned now. Mm. <laughs> you can't mm. actually do it. But it was done uh, uh, back then when you could still do things like this. Um, but the actual experiment was to test how people respond to authority. So, the per- so there was an actor pretending to be one of the subjects uh, in the experiment, and then there was the real subject, and then there was a scientist who was also just another actor pretending to be a scientist. And so the, 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 the scientist would strap the actor down to like an electric shock chair and then teach them word pairs and then go into another room with the real subject... And the real subject had to ask these word pairs. And if the person got it wrong, which they could hear through this microphone system, they would have to administer electric shocks, increasing the voltage from 15 volts up to 450 volts. Long story short is that they heard audible screaming basically coming from the door of the room next door because the shock voltages got so high. But because the scientist in a white lab coat kept saying to them, please continue with the experiment. Mm. We must finish it. Otherwise, we have to avoid the entire experiment. How, what percentage of people do you think continued up to a oh. lethal 450 volts just because a man in a white lab coat was, was asking them to? It wasn't forcing them to, but just said, please mm. continue. Otherwise, we have to just continue the experiment. What, what percentage? Because psychologists think- predicted one, one tenth of a percent would, would do it. Would go up to four f- and f- one fifty. And what was it? The opposite, ninety yeah. percent of over people doing s- over it. Over seventy percent of people. Mm. Yeah, went that's, up to. that's so, the, the white coat authority. Oh. Exactly. So in your life, you want to be able to infer authority. And one of the one of the uh, great well, there's many different ways to do it. One of the ways to do it is that if you're in um, if you're in a meeting or, or something like that, um, 
and you have a colleague with you, give an expert introduction, like talk well about them. So you can work as a team to mm. be able to speak about other people, because you can't give yourself authority because it just it sounds like boasting, right? <laughs> and so um, if, you're, if you're with somebody and we just don't have time, I wish I could give you like these case studies of amazing how people will just answer the phone. The receptionist would be trained to say, hey, oh, you're looking to buy a house in Cape Town. Let me put you through to Joe, who's one of our best. He's been in the industry for 20 years and he'll definitely be able to help you. Like sales went up 20% just with a simple expert introduction. Mm. So if you're working with someone, just give an expert, just make them seem like an expert mm. and you'll just find that that influence will be through the roof compared to if you mm. didn't do it. It's so simple to do, but it makes a huge difference. 